Welcome to life unrestricted. This is your show if you're sick of living a life controlled by food and exercise rules and if you're ready to learn how to accept yourself and enjoy the heck out of life. My gig is about body image, femininity, self-worth and resilience. Come on, let's walk side by side as we slowly step out of restriction misery and unlock our true selves. Your host, Merit Boxler, is a former national radio DJ, freelance journalist, speaker, and writer with a passion to make women feel good in their bodies. This is a show brought to you live from Switzerland. Hey you, lovely radical. How are you? Welcome back to my little corner of the cool kids of the universe. And in case you're wondering why I call each and every one of this beautiful community a cool kid, when secretly you're probably thinking, damn, but I'm not a cool kid. Here's the thing. Neither was I. Neither am I. Neither was the next person. We were all at one point in our lives trying to belong to the cool kids club, right? And somehow just never feeling like we really belong. And I think it's time to define a new kind of cool kid. The new cool kid, according to Miss Boxler from Zurich, Switzerland, is the former uncool kid. The one with a highly sensitive heart. The one who doesn't define a person's worth by their coolness. The one that offers to others what he or she never had. Meaning a sense of belonging. An atmosphere of appreciation rather than judgment. That's, of course, a pretty warm kind of person, I agree. And I think warm-hearted people are cool. Seriously. The cool kind of cool. That's the kind of cool that I mean when I say cool kids. That's the kind of person I would like to be around. Because it's a person that is very needed in today's world of soul-freezing disconnects, of competition and separation everywhere. So the new cool kid is you. And you, and yes, you too, and me, all of us. Let's redefine a soulful kind of coolness. Well, I hope I didn't talk the whole thing to death right there, but uh, anyway, it should be clear now. Quick question. Would you consider becoming a Patreon of this show? That would really make my day. Since, you know, I give this podcast my all and it would be nice to not go bankrupt while doing it. If you want to show your love by pledging a contribution, please go to my support page on Patreon. You can find it at patreon.com slash life unrestricted. That's P A T r e o n dot com slash life unrestricted regina cynthia and jody you wonderful ladies have made a contribution and i have a special place in my heart for you let me tell you i am so very grateful for your support thank you i hope to keep your ears happy forever after and again thanks a lot Here's my appreciation for today, because it's a special episode to me. I think it's wonderful what I can offer to you, because in today's episode of the Life Unrestricted podcast, I am talking to Dr. Anita Johnston from Colorado and Hawaii. She is a clinical psychologist, certified eating disorder specialist and storyteller who has been working with women struggling with eating and weight for over 30 years. She is the clinical director of the Aipono Eating Disorder Program in Honolulu and the recently opened Aipono Maui Residential Facility on the island of Maui, Hawaii. She is a senior advisor and clinical consultant to focus treatment centers in Chattanooga, Memphis and Knoxville, Tennessee, as well as a consultant to EatFed in Sydney and Melbourne, Australia. She is the author of Eating in the Light of the Moon, which probably many of you know. It's a wonderful book which has been published in six languages. As an international speaker, Dr. Anita Johnson talks about the effects of the preoccupation with dieting and weight 
that keeps millions of women around the world obsessed and all too often unsuccessfully attempting to control their struggles. Her most recent project is an interactive online e-course and women's support circle called The Light of the Moon Cafe. We talked via Skype, and the first thing I told her was that I was very grateful to have her as an expert on my show. My pleasure. I love what you're doing. Thank you. That means a lot to me coming from you. <laughs> So um, before we start and head um, into the whole topic, why don't you tell my audience about you? How did your body journey start? Well, I should have had an eating disorder. And it always baffles me that I didn't. And I've spent a lot of time wondering about that because I have the personality. I have the perfect personality for an eating disorder in that I'm really super sensitive very emotionally sensitive and highly intuitive. And what I found working in the field over these years is that's typically the personality of someone that struggles with eating and weight and body image. And it's not that there's anything wrong with them, but it's we live in a culture that doesn't recognize and honor that. So I've always been confused as to why I didn't. And the more I thought about it, it's because I grew up in a time and a culture where there was no diet mentality. So I grew up on the island of Guam in the Pacific. It's in Micronesia. It's a little island, 30 miles long, four, four to 10 miles wide. And I lived there till I was a junior in college. And I don't remember anyone ever dieting. My mother didn't diet. Her friends didn't diet. And I wasn't so sure if my memory was correct. So a number of years ago, I was talking with a friend who we had been best friends since we were 13. And I said, you know, is my memory off? But I don't remember anyone ever dieting. And she said, no, no one dieted. I said, yeah, our mothers didn't diet. She was right. And just today, I was, I was visiting with a dear friend. We were friends since we were 14 years old. And she happened to be traveling through. And we, we got together yesterday. And I said, hey, I want to ask you, because I just want to check my memory. And she said, no, no one dieted back then. So I think that is what saved me. Wow, honestly. that's amazing. Because mm -hmm. it was an island, you think? Well, first of all, a tiny island. And it was the 50s and 60s. So on Guam, we were about 15 years behind everything. So diet mentality hadn't hit yet. Wow. It was a part of the culture, you know, and, and I think, I think that made all the difference in the world. That's as best I've been able to piece it together. But that's pretty significant, because I raised two daughters. And um, they're now in their 30s. But w I watched what they were exposed to. And now when I was growing up, there was there weren't a lot of magazines to start off with. There were a few. There was 17 magazine was just around. And there was, like, good housekeeping. There really – and then there was this thing called True Confessions, which was these sordid stories. But there weren't any photos or images. And so, you know, of course, this is before the Internet. And we had – television that had one station it was black and white nobody ever watched it because it was terrible mm -hmm. so I wasn't exposed to the advertising media either so um, I look at what my daughters were exposed to and it was just image after image after image now we're talking you know 20 25 years ago it has increased exponentially um and um i think if you happen to be vulnerable if you happen to have the right personality type it's going to affect you because you're going to start off thinking oh there's something wrong with me that i don't look like that and 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 then um somewhere along the line you're going to come across a diet and then you're going to have a culture that reinforces that if you lose weight and they go, oh, you look wonderful. And 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 then there's the whole shame cycle that begins. So um, I, I that's kind of my story. I think it, it's been a little baffling to me, but I've been watching it as I've gone along because I've been curious about how this whole process works. I've been now working in the field for 30 years, so I've been fascinated um, by 
women's issues and what it means to be in the body of a woman uh, these days. Mm-hmm. So, so that's how I began, being very curious about it. Where did you raise your daughters? In Hawaii. Did they ever fall prey to the diet mentality and diet culture messages? Yes. They did? In fact, yes. And my younger daughter, now here I am, right? I'm an expert in the field, but the force is immense. And my younger daughter was a dancer. And what happened is that she developed Osgood Schlatter syndrome. I don't know if you know what that is, but nope. the bones don't harden properly. And so she was a really good dancer. She loved it. But then the, the doctor said, you're grounded for two years. You cannot dance. And so she developed an eating disorder and, and, and struggled with compulsive eating and bulimia and all of that. And so I didn't catch it soon enough with her. I, I kind of missed that. I did not see that one coming because I talked to her dance teacher and I said, look, I don't want any discussion about body and blah, blah, blah. And the dance teacher all along said, oh, no, no, we don't do that. And I found out later she did it put tremendous pressure on my daughter. And then when my daughter couldn't dance and started putting on weight, um, it, it developed into an eating disorder. And my older daughter, I knew she had the temperament. She was very perfectionistic. And so she wanted to go to um, the school in in Hawaii that was a very intense kind of prep school. In fact, that's where Obama went. And um, I said, no, 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 you've got, you know, I know you and you'll just get into getting good grades and you won't learn how to have friends or be with boys because she was also very shy. And we argued for about a year. And then finally I said, all right, you can go to that school under one condition. You can't get straight A's. And she said, mm-hmm. what? She said, what kind of a mother are you? I said, I know who you are. And so that was our deal. And I said, in, in those conditions, you can go because you need to learn, you know, to develop some more social skills. So I saw it coming with her because she had the personality to develop more of an anorexic type of struggle and but I missed it with my younger daughter so you know what I'm saying it's like it's a it's a David and Goliath thing we're out there you know um sometimes in the trenches but the cultural force is immense which is why I'm always happy to go speak anywhere that I can um because we have to speak out against that Mm mm-hmm I think women nowadays, we're basically breathing poison every day, wherever we look, whatever we hear. Yeah. It's all about appearance and, and all mm-hmm. smiles and all thin and all young and all well-dressed. And it's oh. so, it's annoying at this point. It makes me angry also. That's why I'm speaking up because it's like, wow, I didn't ever question all this. And there's mm-hmm. such power in all the messages especially for younger women, and I'm not a young person um, anymore, but uh, I only developed the eating issues later in life. Or, no, they manifested in different ways. Let's Mm -hmm. let's put it that way. I think there was always a difficult relationship to food Mm -hmm. all along, but when they were mixed with the messages that came from the outside, it turned Mm -hmm. nasty. So... Is the struggle of your daughter the reason you wrote that beautiful book, oh, Eating in the Light of the Moon? No, no, that, that's what made things very difficult. I had already been an expert in the field. What, what made you, so what made you become an expert in the field of eating disorder? Because it wasn't your daughter's. Right. So I, um, I was always interested in women's issues. Now, I grew up in a, in a culture that, whose roots were matrilineal at, on Guam. And, um, what does this mean? I plead that, ignorance, that, I'm sorry. Matrilineal is when it's the mother line that is um, perceived as important in terms of property and inheritance and all of that. Uh-huh. So then we had 200 years of Spanish rule and the Spaniards said, no, 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 it has to be through the father line. But they kind of compromised. And so so um, you still kept your mother's your maiden name, your middle name was your mother's maiden name. And then the Americans came after the Spanish-American War, and, and that's how Guam became a part of America. And they said, no, 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 you cannot have the mother, you, you have to have the father's name. So, so, but this 
wasn't too many years ago. And so I had a grandmother who was very prominent because during World War II, the island was occupied by the Japanese and people were tortured and she led the underground resistance. And she too was tortured, but she she hid the one American left on the island who had a ham radio that would tell about what was going on in the war. And she had a soap factory and she wrapped uh, the news up in the, the paper for the soap. And so she was. She started the first, after the war, started the first high school, the first Red Cross, the first Girl Scouts. And so whenever there was a need, she said, well, let's, we just create it. And my mother was a very strong, uh, she was an archivist. And so I grew, and I had a bunch of aunties that were prominent in, in politics. And so I kind of grew up with strong women. And I was also multi-ethnic. So uh, my grandmother was Chamorro and my mother was American. And so I was so curious about women and culture. And so when I did my doctoral dissertation, I did it on the ethnic identity of Chamorro women because that's I was curious as to who I was. And then I really got into women's issues. And I thought the struggle with eating and weight seemed to be the most pervasive and, in my mind, compelling issue. It struck everybody. And I couldn't find anyone who could, let's say, go buy a new bathing suit, look in the mirror and go, yes, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I thought, wait, what's going on here? So that's how I got into it. Um, uh, even before my children were born, I, I started writing that book. It took me, it took me 10 years. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it wasn't because of my children's struggle. I was just curious as to what this phenomena was that was going on, that women couldn't be comfortable in their own skin. Very interesting. Yeah. It was like more than 16 years ago that your your book, Eating in the Light of the Moon, came out. 20. More than 20 already? Oh, mm -hmm. all right. It took me years to write it, so it was a long time in the making. Yeah, I believe. Those are beautiful stories. Mm -hmm. um, it's a book that I read even before I fully understood how much this was about eating issues, because for me it was a beautiful book about what it means to be a woman in today's world and how we can find the way to our true authentic selves or our center. But still, it took me about 10 years of suffering before I dug it up again and mm -hmm. saw how your multi-layered mystical tales and legends and myths were a metaphor for my own and so many other women's eating issues. So, um, mm -hmm. you know it, everyone knows it, this book resonated with millions of women who are preoccupied with weight and food. Mm -hmm. And it's the good thing is that it's basically a book that never gets old, even more so than today's world is getting crazier and crazier, even with this obsession with thinness. But what made you write it in this unique way that it's written? Well, again, I grew up in a multi-ethnic culture. So in my household, there were old women from different cultures, the Chamorro culture, the Filipino culture, the American culture. And... Um, I was taught in story. So Candida was a little Filipina lady that lived with us, and she was always telling us stories to entertain us as, as kids. And then, but it wasn't until I was raising my own children, and they were going to Walder schools. I think you call them Steiner schools in yes, Europe. Mm -hmm. And so when I took them to school, there were, there were three rules. Um, no violence, no picture shirts, and no Disney talk. And I thought that was the strangest thing. I thought, what is this, a cult? So I started studying Steiner to find out. Mm -hmm. And what Steiner understood is that how vulnerable young children were to images. And because of that, things were taught in story form. So my kids would come home and they, as they were going through school and they'd say, oh, today we learned about Prince Division and Prince Multiplication. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I would know my times tables. Mm -hmm. <laughs> If I had been taught that way, <laughs> yes. so I realized how story, how compelling and how deep storytelling could go because they would learn about Prince Division and Prince Multiplication in first grade, even though they weren't. And then later on, years later, 
it had been seeded. And so when they were actually learning their maths, then they would refer the teacher would reference back to that story. And so I was in private practice at the time. And I thought, well, this can work with my clients, especially with the eating and weight difficulties, because they're so complex. And so I started using stories and metaphors to help somebody understand, to get past the literal perception of what was going on. Because typically, if someone who was struggling thought it was about food and fat and couldn't get past that, and because we live in a culture that's so darn literal, um, it, they needed a little help. <laughs> so I started bringing in the old stories because what happens is with a story, it creates what Steiner called a living picture in the eye of the mind. Mm -hmm. And Carl Jung says those images um, uh, connect and the stories connect with the psyche on multiple levels, uh, the mental and, and the imaginative and the emotional, which is why I would pick stories that had a strong emotion. And because of that, the impact could be more lasting so that even if a client in the beginning, you know, it, to them it was just a story, as time went on, I'd say, remember that story I told you? Isn't this what's going on for you right now? And then the story would come to life and, and things could move at a very, very deep level. How long had you been working with clients before you realized what was going on or what, what the common thread was? I think from the very beginning, I started trying to figure it out because I had was supervising a um, psychology intern in Hawaii who was doing her doctoral dissertation on the in, uh, incidence of eating disorders. And so she and I would meet and, and uh, a third woman joined us who had had her own recovery experience, but she had had to figure it out herself. There was no help. And so we got together and every time we would meet and we would meet every week trying to see what was going on with the eating and weight issues. And again, it was a curiosity. Wait a minute, because there's a problem here. And we would say, well, there ought to be a center for this. So many people are struggling. And after about the fifth time, we looked at each other and we went, OK, I guess we're it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we created center and girls and women of all ethnicities all walks of life all body sizes would come it was like you build it and they come now no men came in those days it was all women so then it's my curiosity i i couldn't help myself because i i found myself wondering okay wait a minute what is going on here first of all why is it females second of all why is it these particular females and third um, why is the struggle around eating and weight? Now, because I'm a storyteller, um, uh, I was fascinated by their stories, but I'm also, as a psychologist, I'm a trained story listener. So I listened as carefully as I could to find what is the common denominator? What is it? And what I found is that these girls and women were like the child in the fairy tale, The Emperor's New Clothes. In that, you know, and, and in that story, you have this very vain emperor. He doesn't care much about ruling his kingdom. He's mostly interested in fine clothing and jewelry. And he had a reputation for this. And, and uh, some con artists came into town and they pretended to be tailors. And they said, oh, our clothing is so fine. Only those fit for their station in life can even see it. Well, the emperor was impressed, and so he commissioned a whole new wardrobe for himself. And, and the con artist pretended to cut and stitch clothing that really mm -hmm. wasn't Mm -hmm. But all the people that surrounded the emperor were ooing and aahing about the fabulous clothing and even the emperor himself because he didn't want people to think he wasn't fit for his station in life and all of those who surrounded him didn't want to lose their jobs. And so the con artists, they take the money and they laugh all the way to the bank and then there's a, a, a grand procession and the emperor's wearing his new outfit. Of course, Which is he's nothing. <laughs> isn't good, right? But all the townspeople, they didn't want their neighbor to think they were stupid. So they were ooing and eyeing about the fabulous clothing. But there was a child in the crowd that said in a very loud voice, But mommy, the emperor has no clothes on at all. <laughs> and when the child spoke, it created a ripple throughout the crowd. And everyone saw the emperor for the fool that he was. So what I found was that these girls and women were like that child in the in the story. But the problem was their what lives What do you mean were, when you say that? They were very intuitive, very emotionally sensitive. They could read between the lines, see the bigger picture. They could perceive hypocrisy. They could sense when 
things were not okay if everyone around them was saying things are just fine. And so what happened is because all children, like all of us, want a sense of belonging, but they confuse belonging, as we all typically do, with fitting in. And they recognize, oh, I'm seeing things, I'm picking up on things, and, and nobody else is. And when they would speak, and I'm talking as young as a four-year-old, saying, oh, but mommy, if daddy loves us, how come he never comes home at night? You or get something? shut down, yeah. Yeah. Shut down, they were either ignored, mm-hmm. or they were rejected. In, in some instances, they were ridiculed. Mm-hmm. In other instances, abused. Mm-hmm. So had to find some way to dim their light, to, to, to diminish this capacity to perceive the invisible, the, the non-literal, non-physical that our culture denies is real. And so, so how does the eating and food come in? Well, they get this idea there's something wrong with me. There's something fundamentally wrong with me, and I don't know what it is. Until somewhere along the line, either because they go on a diet or somebody says something about their body, then they go, oh, I know what's wrong with me. I'm too fat. Mm -hmm. Now, as painful as that is, and that's extraordinarily painful, at least there appears to be a solution. Too fat, lose weight. Too fat, lose weight. And then begins the journey of food and weight obsession and 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 a culture that jumps on board with that and says yep that's the problem all right rather than the problem is in a culture that doesn't acknowledge invisible realities not at all yeah this really yeah. resonated with me when i read your article about this because i identify as very thin skinned as well and yeah. I have for years thought that there was something wrong with me. And I've um, yeah. seen others cope, quote unquote, better with life struggles. I've mm-hmm. seen others not quite as shaken by different incidents in life or not pick up on energies and stuff like that. And I found myself to be overwhelmed much more quickly than others. And this has caused a great deal of shame. And it hurt to hear that I was just too sensitive or overreacting. So I learned to hide this. And I really wasn't aware that this so-called thin-skinnedness is in fact not something to be ashamed of, but something normal, even precious. And you have pointed this out. And you have seen Mm -hmm. many women, just like me, turn to food or turn to restricting just anything really connected to food and body to cope with all that. So what skills do you think are important ones to learn to better deal with our sensitive nature? Yeah, I think that's really the failing of the culture, is that we don't teach these skills. And there's one, I would say, well, there's, um, first of all, uh, uh, what you're contributing to is, which is media literacy, you know, really understanding what the media is doing. The other is emotional literacy. We have to develop the capacity to put our feelings into words. Otherwise, we're going to try to communicate what's going on with our behaviors. But the, probably the most critical skill, and if I had it my way, this would be taught in every school around the world, is assertive communication. Because assertive communication is the capacity to speak your truth clearly and and in the kindest way possible. And I've never, ever, ever seen anyone recover from any kind of eating or body image difficulty without developing this skill. So it's the capacity to let other people know how their behavior affects their feelings for their information. Not necessarily to try to control them or stop them, but just say, okay, When you say things like that, this is how I feel and this is how come I feel that way. And if you want to continue doing that, I can't stop you, but I can inform you for your information just in case you forget. And so learning how to communicate in that way is probably um, uh, one of the most profound skills. Uh, And like I say, it's essential if you want to be free. Do you teach that by I, role play? I, I teach it any way I can. So um, 
uh, one of the things we do at the Light of the Moon Cafe, which is my online course, is we we devote a lot of time to that and a lot of support for that. And certainly with my one-on-one clients, um, I, that's an essential skill. And, and we go over it and over it. And it's so exciting. Just last week, I was doing a uh, Skype session with a 17 year old. She was a dancer and she was struggling because the other dancers, they were bullying her, they were shunning her, and she had an eating disorder. And so um, I said, Well, let's wait for the opportunity for you to practice this because I've been teaching her the, just the fundamentals. And then the day came, sure enough, one of the girls had gone to another girl and said that, that, that this person that I was seeing, um, had said something that she didn't say. And I said, okay, here we go. So she asserted herself, because there's a little formula that you use, and and I was kind of walking her through it. And then she said, I felt so strong that all the dancers were in the locker room. And in front of all of them, I said, you know, I just, I don't know who's saying this, but I just want you to know, this is not what I said, and this is what I said, and this is how it affected me when I heard that my words were being misinterpreted. And she said, all the other dancers and went, oh, okay. And she said it was over because rather than scurrying into the corner with her tail between her legs and rather than being mean, what, joining the mean girls and lashing out or, or joining the mean girls as a way of connecting and thinking you're safe, she stood there and she was just, she was beyond excited. She said, I can't even believe this. This is so, I'm so excited. I can't wait to practice with my father and my sister. And I've been practicing with my mom. And so it became uh, once, it's like riding a bike in the beginning. It's, it's really hard. But once you get the hang of it, it gets very exciting. It's a very different world you start to, to live in just because you change the way you react. Yeah, sometimes I think it's just a little support, a nudge and permission mm -hmm. also that we need to try this out and, and approach it playfully and see how good it actually feels to say no or to stand up for your boundaries and stuff that we never been taught. Just as you said, we were never <laughs> used to it. We were used to playing small or or um, to go with the with the nasty girls to just stay safe or just, mm -hmm. you know, to further betray our own values. So it's really good to just have someone to explain how this works and how good it can feel and have permission to, to play around with it. So I, I love this story. It's a little hard because it requires some soul searching and sometimes a little assistance in finding out what's really going on with you because you have to know that you have to stand it that's where your strength comes from is identifying what the feelings are that are coming up for you and how come can you make an example uh let me think with this particular girl i said okay what feelings came up for you when you heard this was being said and it took her a while she had to track the feeling and then she then she was able to recognize that she felt hurt and annoyed And then it was then it was a matter of okay, what was the particular behavior that that stirred up that feeling in you? Because other people don't make you feel a certain way, but they can stir up feelings that are already inside. And so then she was able to find, oh, okay, so the feelings were because I was being told I did things that I did not do. So so once you get very, very clear, it gets easier to stand in the truth. But oftentimes we're not, like I said, we're not very emotionally literate. So it takes a while to find the feeling. And then how come that particular behavior stirred up that particular feeling in you? And that's where this comes from. Do you find most women's struggles with their eating and weight uh, stem from the same issues that lay underneath? It does stem from... Um, a difficulty identifying, accepting, and expressing the feelings that come up in them. Because typically at a very early age, they were told there was something wrong with them for feeling the way they were feeling. So I wouldn't say it's the same issues, but it typically is emotionally based. And how can we read into that and try and find out what our own personal behavior around food and weight, what well, this might represent? 
Yeah, it's a matter of paying attention. So, yes, this is a David and Goliath issue. We're up against a culture, but consciousness trumps everything. So the more you can be aware of the story inside of yourself, I'll give you an example from my own life. So I was getting ready to go on a um, a trip. I was flying out of Hawaii, and I was going to go give a talk on <laughs> negative body image. And I'm going through the checkout line, and I'm getting my little shampoos and my little toothbrush pastes, that sort of thing. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw a magazine with a young woman in a bikini and a beautiful airbrushed belly. Now, mind you, I've been working in this field a long time, but but it, it, we get hit very easily. We don't even realize that billions of dollars have been spent to um, get into our psyche in this way. So what happened is out of the corner of my eye, I saw that and the thought that popped into my head is, Oh, I wish I had a body like that. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm ready for it because I know it's going to happen. It's this is I, I don't even think these are our thoughts, but somehow they land on us and 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 if you don't know how to handle those thoughts when they land, you're in trouble. So, I caught the thought. I went, "Oh." And so I said, and I have a toolkit ready waiting. And and so the the key is always a dialogue, never a monologue. So, I have another voice that I brought up and I said, "Well, I need to you used to have a body like that, maybe when you were 13 or 12. And how did you like your body then? Oh, I didn't like it very much then. I thought my butt was too big and, and I was too flat and I had all these and, and too many pimples and whatever. And so, but that, that first voice that, that has the cultural press doesn't stop. And it said, but I'd really uh, appreciate that body now. And so I bring up the other voice and it says, well, you carried and birthed two children. Would you trade them for that body? And it was like, of course not. You know, I would never do that. And, but it never stops. And so it says, yeah, but think of all the cool clothes you could wear with a body like that. And then I bring in the kicker, the one that when, when it starts getting rough, this one always works for me. And the, the final one was, Anita, how would your 80-year-old self like the body you have now? Oh, oh. So you would seek it very much. And then that kind of ended it for me. Now, this is all taking place in a matter of seconds in my mind, right, as I'm going through the checkout line. And I get to the front of the line and where I'm buying, and I see that the magazine um, had been flipped backwards. And I was looking at the back cover of, get this, Sports Illustrated Swimwear Edition. And I thought, oh, Anita, you've just been had, but really only for a couple of minutes, because I was ready. I knew, you know, I know this this will hit me from time to time because uh, of the world we live in. So, but I had a I had a dialogue in my pocket ready to have this conversation in my own mind with myself and then it was over. Sounds like a skill we have to learn, like to establish this dialogue between our nasty voice and 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 the voice your that is your compassionate kind voice. Mm -hmm. that we all have. And it's also, it's what I call um, compassionate curiosity. Because if you can start saying, okay, so let's say you're walking along, you're, oh my God, my thighs, my thighs are disgusting. When did I learn that my thighs were disgusting? Mm -hmm. And who taught that to me? Was it something my older brother said when I was 10 years old? And, and if, he, if so, why would he care about my thighs? Why would he put all that energy into, you know, what was going on in his life? Um, maybe he was, um, he too was starting to be afraid of feminine sexuality, which the whole world is afraid of, by the way, mm -hmm. churches, governments, and, and men and women. And I mean, it's a, it, and, and maybe that was the impetus for those kinds of comments. You see, if you get curiouser and curiouser, rather than just believing any thought that pops into your head. Um, it, it's, it's that kind of dialogue with your compassionate, curious self that's not blaming or attacking, but is investigating fiercely. Where did this come from? Were you born thinking that about your thighs? <laughs> I never asked myself all that until I was 40, and I'm 43 now. So I, did, I had never heard of self-compassion before. I just heard this inner gremlin voice, and it totally had me in its grip, and there was no other opinion allowed. And so I wasn't even 
aware that I could speak back. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it's really good to learn about this. And you said that everybody has this compassionate voice inside them. But um, a few years ago, I would have told you, no, I don't have it. Yeah, because the other voices got so loud. Yes. And they got loud because of the attention. Um, I, you want to hear a story? I have a story about this. Sure. And and it's not in my book because I didn't find the story till way later. And uh, I'm going to warn you and your listeners, if this story were a movie, I wouldn't go see it. Okay? Good. But it's an, I think it's an important story about uh, body image. So the story is there was once this king who had been on a hunting expedition, and it was a very successful hunting expedition, and but they had been gone a long time. And as the hunting party came galloping into the castle, they were greeted, as they always were, with the king's closest companion, the king's best friend, the king's confidant, the dog that he had raised from the time she was a puppy. But as the dog came out to greet the hunting party, she started acting really strange. And she started um, growling and barking and spinning around and running away and then coming a little closer. And, and the king said, oh, my gosh, I've been gone so long. My dog's gone mad. And he chased after the dog as it ran through the corridors of the castle. And then the dog stopped abruptly at the entrance to the nursery of the king's firstborn and snarled and barked and spun around and as the king got closer he noticed to his horror the dog's muzzle was covered with blood and when he stepped into the nursery he saw the walls were splattered with blood and across the way was the infant's cradle overturned he was enraged at the betrayal of his best friend his closest companion he pulled out his sword and plunged it into the dog's heart and then he heard a cry and he ran across the room, and there, beneath the carcass of a dead wolf, was his infant totally unharmed. Now, is this the worst story you've ever heard? Yeah. Horrible. Mm -hmm. and, I'll, and But I'm going to break it down for you, and I'm going to tell you why I tell this story. Because all of these fairy tales, they're like our dreams. They represent different aspects of our psyche. So immediately, all of us identified with the king because we've all been there where we've, we jump to some conclusion. We, we, we assess something too quickly, improperly, and we did or said something that was irrevocable, that was horrible, that was destructive. So we all feel this pit in, in our stomach when we hear what the king did because it's like, oh my gosh, if only the king had pushed the pause button for a moment to see the truth for what it was. And he wouldn't then, have slayed his own, his own yes, dog. Yes, friend. So, who is the dog in this story? The dog is our body. Hmm. Our closest companion, our most loyal friend that will be with us from the day we are born until the day we die. Amazing. Oh don't assess the whole situation we, we what we do to our bodies we plunge that knife into our hearts we are so cruel we are so mean the things we say and when all it does is try and protect us and yes and, and and just alert us and 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 the wolf who's the wolf diet culture well, yes and no. The wolf is our inner critic that hangs with the pack of media wolves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is really the culprit here. That It's that voice that has the chorus of the media wolves right behind it. That's the real culprit. Totally. And, and the child? The child is what I call our soul self, our, the truest part of ourselves, our pure creativity, the essence of who we are. It's 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 like there there will never be another Anita like me on the planet. There there never has been one. And the same for you and the same for everyone. That's what's most precious about us, our the uniqueness of our being. But it's preyed upon by wolves, by our inner critic that says um, what the media wolf says, that we need to look like and act like and think like and be like everybody else. And if we're not, there's something wrong with us. 
Mm -hmm. Blame our body because we, we go around feeling there's something wrong with us. We walk past a mirror and we see that we don't look like the culture, the pictures in all the magazines. And we go, oh, that's what's wrong. It's my belly. It's my butt. It's my wrinkles. It's my, you know, flabby thighs or whatever our mm -hmm. eyes land upon. And then we are like the king. We don't push the pause button. No, and the bloodshed begins. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important whenever someone has what I call a fat attack. And that's when out of nowhere, because maybe 10 minutes ago or maybe yesterday, you weren't feeling so fat. All of a sudden you're feeling fat. What is that? What is that? How did that thought come in? And if you push the pause button, typically what you're going to find is, yes, you are upset. And maybe you're upset at something a coworker said, or maybe you're nervous about an upcoming parent-teacher meeting at school, or maybe you're, you're worried about your finances, but we don't push the pause button. And because we're such a literal culture, the, the first thing our eyes land upon is our body, and boom, we think that's the problem. Like and, the yeah, and we say we feel fat when there's not really a feeling fat mm -hmm. at all. Exactly. But we know we don't feel okay because we're sensitive beings, but we haven't quite figured out what that is. And, and like I said, because everyone says, well, the body is what it's all about. Boom, there we are. It's incredible. Yeah. You mentioned um, female sexuality and femininity before. And I really <laughs> want to ask you to go on that tangent. Well, if you look at, and so this is what I got curious, it was, it was, I started looking at, okay, what is the body, body ideal? And for heaven's sakes, why is that the body ideal for a woman, which is probably the body of a prepubescent boy uh, with breasts, mm -hmm. but steel, you know, flat belly, um, now we have this horrible thing called the thigh gap, I, I can't even stand to almost say it, oh, but, it's, but wait, who has bodies like that? Boys, wait, so wait a minute, why, why should women have bodies like boys? What is that about? And I would ask my clients, okay, what is the part of your body you, you hate the most? And typically, it's the belly, the butt, and the thighs, mm -hmm. well, you know, other parts, but, but that's typically. And it's like, okay, if you were to look at that, what is that? If you look with curiosity, and uh, is that that is the seat of Femi the power of feminine sexuality, that is where we carry the capacity to create life and sustain life. And, and what girls aren't taught is that one of the reasons we get these thighs is because in the event you have a baby and you want to feed that baby through breastfeeding, your body has to store the fat to create the milk someplace. So, so there's this whole design that if you can kind of pull the lens back and be in awe of it, the flip side of awe is fear because the, you know, there's, a, there's a power there. And so I'm going, okay, so only woman can, can carry and sustain life. Isn't it interesting that those in power would want to diminish that aspect and ridicule it and dismiss it and disregard it and make it an ugly thing. So that's kind of where my mind goes because when you start getting curious, you just go, wait a minute, why is that? And then you start to see things. You start to see the power dynamics for what they are. Yeah, and, and you see women's oppression and why yes. is that such a big deal? And I mean, we don't want to talk about the American election right now because this is this pushes all my buttons. It's like we're falling back into the stone ages. But the thing is, it's always been there, but now it's being revealed. You mm -hmm. see, it's revealed in its crassness. In it's, it's like it's been there all along, but it's been prettied up. You know, and now we're seeing it's not women's bodies that are ugly. It's what has been said by the patriarchy that's ugly. And that that is what we're starting to see now. And I get it. This is a really rough time. But it was a rough time when women couldn't vote when women couldn't speak in public you know that that wasn't too long ago that it was illegal in in america 
for a woman to speak in. But so it's like you have to really pull back. And I, I'm in there. I'm in there for the fight. But I'm also keeping my eye on it's being revealed now. It's being revealed. And, and we all need to say, okay, yes, we've all been there. But there are a lot of people that, that didn't know this. There are a lot of people that didn't know how pervasive the focus and the and the negative comments about a woman's body and a woman having curves and a woman having fat and all of that, how, how horrible it's been to, to be in that skin and, and to have strangers come up and comment on your body. Mm-hmm. If you're a woman of size, that happens all the time. But other people don't know that. And now it's being revealed. Yeah, and how can we help make this better? First for ourselves, as in detaching from all this or seeing it for what mm-hmm. it is. And second of all, to also make it better as in trying to end this whole fat shaming thing. Right. That's why the compassionate, curious voice is so important. Because as you develop it within yourself, then those are the conversations you can be having with your daughters, for example. Oh, why do you think that person said that? What do you think that's about? Why would why would somebody care about what you look like? Why why would they think that was important? You see you start getting curious and why is it important to you? And what do you think it means? And how did you get that idea that that's what it means? And blah, 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 just getting curiouser and curiouser, because that's how the truth gets revealed. But as we seek validation from the outside world, I mean, that behavior has been installed in our basic DNA almost, because it makes us feel safer when we are validated somehow. So the first step towards healing, I understand, is detaching from all that and validate yourself. Which well, is really- it's spontaneous. You see, there's a tribe. There's a tribe of women. And and we're all over the place. And f- seek those out. Seek those. So, yes, you detach. But, but who wants to detach and then just kind of be out there floating like a human in space? Hmm. Detach from that and and connect. Find community. With the tribe. Of the community of women that are saying, The emperor has no clothes. Yes. And they're out there. You and I, we're part of that tribe. Mm. Um, That's what I do at Light in the Moon Cafe. I'm I'm trying to create a community that has non-diet mentality and and not only decries fat shaming, but really supports the awe-inspiring gift of what it means to be born into the body of a woman that can carry fat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned your Light of the Moon Cafe, and um, just to explain, this is an online platform and a support circle for women around the world who are looking for freedom from their difficulties with eating and weight stuff. You provide healing images and experiences that help us all deepen this understanding of struggles with food, fat, and dieting within the safety, as you mentioned, of this online support circle. And I sure am also part of different communities because, as you said, if I feel like in outer space by myself, then I probably wouldn't have the strength to go on on this path. And you describe the platform as the online companion workbook for your bestseller, uh, the Eating in the Light of the Moon book. So can you describe the project a little in more detail? For years, people had asked me if I would do a workbook for Eating in the Light of the Moon. And every time I thought about it, I thought, oh, that feels boring to me. <laughs> I can't do anything that's boring. But then I, I had a friend who was running uh, Eating in the Light of the Moon support group. She was a colleague. She was a dietitian. And no, she was making more and more book groups because no one wanted to leave. And so we said, would it be possible to create Women's Circle online? And I wasn't sure, you know, it, it would be, but we tried. And we created the Light of the Moon Cafe, and it worked. So, so the way it is is that when someone signs up for an eight-week series, 
every day in their email. They'll get an audio of me telling a story, kind of like the king and the dog story, and then interpreting it. Uh, what That would be, let's say day one would be, okay, this this week we're reading chapter seven in Eden Lie the Moon. And then the next day would be me telling the story and interpreting it. Then the next day might be a downloadable PDF where you could take the question, have questions about the story and see how it applies to your life using the metaphors in the story. And then the, the next day might be a poem uh, that has to do around those concepts. And the next day might be a, uh, another audio of me uh, telling a metaphor. And then the next day might be a drawing or writing um, activity. And then the next day might be a, a playlist of songs to listen to. And then we have a forum where everybody communicates. And it doesn't matter of the time. You can go at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, to the cafe because we have women in South Africa and then in Canada and across the U.S. and, and in Belgium. And, so, um, and, and I'm on the forum all the time chiming in. And then we have three live calls where people can call in and say, okay, I'm struggling with pizza. What does that mean? Or I'm having this issue with my body. How can I look at it differently? And and so um, it be, there's voices, and that's what happens is you go to the cafe, and you the chorus of voices you get to listen to, because everyone's chiming in, is, is the antidote to what you're hearing out there in the everyday world. And, and as these voices grow and grow, and more of us get the habit of, of communicating this way and it, and it eventually affects your belief system because if you're hearing something different all the time um, to yourself when you're talking to yourself and with others it, it does create resiliency and so so we deal with everything from for example mm, the menstrual cycle so so in our culture people will say oh my gosh she's pmsing and and we go oh no it's called premenstrual sensitivity and that's the time when our intuition is the sharpest and and our emotional guidance system is so on board that if uh, something has been bothering us throughout the month at this point in time we can't continue to shine it on and we have to speak it how different is that you see then nobody can shame you for something that you don't feel shame about it, you become more like teflon rather than velcro Beautiful. Yeah, that's a reframing skill mm -hmm. also, isn't it? Yes, over and over and over. It does take, um, you know, consistency. And, and, and what we do now know is when you do that, you are literally creating new neural pathways in your brain. That is exactly what's happening. And, and the more you have that kind of repetition, um, the more you create, you, it goes from like a little trail through the jungle to a super highway. And you start having those kinds of thoughts more easily, more quickly than the old negative body shaming, body bashing thoughts. It does change your brain. Yeah, It's very cool. <laughs> it is. Are you working with um, grown adult women as well or mostly girls or adolescent well, I, girls? Mostly adults. We have some older teens that come to the cafe, but it's mostly women all through ages through their 70s. Yeah, because I think adults with disordered eating and eating disorders, it's becoming more and more and more uh, uh, prevalent mm -hmm. in society. I don't, I don't know hardly any woman who is totally relaxed ar around food and her body. So yeah. I was well, trying, what, what are your thoughts about that? Because it's not really that... You know, we have this cliche idea of eating disorders only being the anorexic, stick-thin, white, middle-class, 17-year-old. Mm, not at all. In fact, right now, um, I'm releasing, if, if anyone is interested, if you go to lightofthemooncafe.com, I'm releasing a series of videos, free videos that anyone can, can watch. This is the and Soul Hunger series? Soul Hunger series. And just yesterday, a woman wrote in and she said, look, you know, I did OA for a while and I, I, I was able to get down to this and this weight. And but then I had an, you know, a divorce and I put on this weight and now I can't lose it. And I've done this. and I've done this. And I've tried this diet and blah, blah, blah. And I can't lose the weight. And um, I can't get back to that weight. And, and I feel like, what do I do? What do I try? And the thing that struck me the most And and occurred to me is like oh you're there's there's this other myth in our culture that says a woman should weigh the same thing her entire life. 
And and so when I wrote back to this woman, because I there's a forum there, and I communicate back, and I said, you know, there's this myth that we're we're supposed to you know weigh the same thing. And she wrote back. She goes, oh my gosh, I was thinking here I am, seventy years old, and I should be weighing what I what I what I weighed when I was in my forties. You know, wait, what is that about? That our weight is never supposed to change. And now new research is coming out that as a woman gets older. You know, our, our midriffs get get a little bigger, and and now what that what that's revealing with the new research of people who are w- researching women's bodies, not men's bodies, and just extrapolating, is that that's your that's your safety line, um, that's going to keep you alive. So the body knows something about that, and as part of our biology, just like when a girl when she's young and she. First starts her menstrual cycle, nobody is telling our girls that you have to have a weight gain fairly rapid to to have enough fat to jumpstart the progesterone to start your menstrual cycle for the very first time. So we're not being taught this. And so we think, oh, you have teenage girls that think they should still have the body of when they were 11. Um, and you have older women that think they should have the body what, that they had when they were 20. And again, I go, wait, what is that about? So, so I think that's kind of a compelling idea also is like our bodies is not, are never supposed to change. I mean, it's the same thing. Like we're not supposed to get wrinkles or, or gray hair. It's like, no, we're supposed to stay the same. Why is that? Why, why on earth would we think that we should not change and grow? Why is because it's on every magazine title, like I want to go back to my pre-baby body and, and, and women who are talking about no excuses bodies and this and that. It's so harmful. So it's a really long process to detach from that and grow resilient to it, isn't it? But why do you think that that's the case? I mean, I yes, it's the case. It's on the mo- But Why? because diet culture makes a lot of money with this for starters but why did they pick that but even before there was a lot of money to be made you know this has been going on a long time if you go back to to corsets <laughs> mm-hmm. right i mean yeah people are making money off of that that's true but it's such a it's such a curious thing tell me I, why it's a good <laughs> question I don't know. I think the question is more important than the answer even. Because when you start questioning, you stop accepting it as the truth. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, and so, you see the ongoing oppression, whether it be corsets or anything. Mm. It's just something, some standard that most yeah. women can't live up to and they're busy living their life trying to do so and not really living their lives. And, and what would happen if women stopped and started living their lives? We would I mean, change the world. Yes, we would. So don't you think that's scary if you're in a position of power and like things to be just the way they are because you're at the top of the heap? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It looks like. But why are men afraid of that? I mean, they play their game, we play our game, and we, we would be perfect together. It's not just men that are afraid. You see, the patriarchy is not just men. It, there, there's women that are a part of the patriarchy also. Mm-hmm. Patriarchy is where the masculine principle ha- is is held as better than the feminine principle. And because women are the embodiment of the feminine principle and we live in a literal culture, that that's where you see the oppression of women. But if you just keep zooming out, you're going to see it's the feminine principle. And what is that? That's intuitive, emotional matters of the heart, uh, uh, relational uh, aspects of our being. Um, and, and again, it's not like that's better than the masculine. And the masculine is logical, linear, goal, achievement oriented. And I'm not talking gender. I'm talking about a, a principle. And, and the reason why I use the words masculine and feminine is that in, in Jungian terms, in your dreams, the, the, the archetype of the masculine is represented by a male and the archetype of the feminine as a female. But, but these are energies that exist in both men and women, but there's a fear of the feminine principle because the masculine has been dominant 
for a long, long time, thousands of years. And what happens when somebody is in a, in a position of power, they don't want to give it up. They don't understand that everybody stands to win in a more egalitarian world. How can we sell this better <laughs> so that people are not afraid of that? I mean, to me, it doesn't sound scary. It sounds beautiful, right? It sounds beautiful. Well, if you believe it's beautiful and you stand in it and somebody tries to shame you for being, oh, you're so you're just too emotional. And you say, as in there's a song by Jewel where she says, please be careful. I'm very sensitive and I want to stay that way. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, it takes a while to learn all that. And then after a while, now I wouldn't be attackable on that subject. But for 40 years, I was. I was totally trying not to let on how emotional I was. And I had to be educated on this. See, here's, here's where we get confused. We confuse belonging with fitting in. Now, totally human condition is we all want to belong that we're, we're born with that desire to belong but what happens is when we confuse it with fitting in then we're trapped because be what belonging is is connecting to self while you connect with others fitting in means you abandon yourself in order to connect with others and and i think we have to be taught Because we're not taught that these are very different things. And when you disconnect from self to connect with others, then there's this ongoing alienation and you feel like something's wrong. And then you think, oh, there's something wrong with me and there's something wrong with the way I look. No, the problem is, is you disconnected from your true self. And that's what it feeds this, this belief. But it's, it's a confusion. It's a confused belief. Mm-hmm. You're also the clinical director of Aipono in Hawaii, where you offer many different uh, treatment programs for many different people at many different stages of the journey, I guess. Um, first of all, I want to tell you that I really love the name. Um, it's a really thoughtful name also. Aipono, I read, stands for I, meaning to eat, mm -hmm. nourish, and pono, meaning with ease, naturally, and in perfect order and wholeness. So it perfectly describes what the overall purpose of Aipono Hawaii really is. Um, how did you come up with all this? Well, I, I actually, that's a precious name to me because it was given to me by, I had a client who was Hawaiian and her teacher gave me that name to use. So in the Hawaiian culture, you really need to be very respectful And for example, the word pono, even though it's only four letters, it's a huge word in, in, in the Hawaiian language and Hawaiian culture because it does mean body, mind, soul, to make right. Uh, and, and, and so I was given that name when, when I created uh, the center years ago. And then um, just three years ago, in fact, today is our third uh, year anniversary of Aipono Maui, which is the residential program that I have on the island of Maui. And it's a oceanfront, uh, eight bed house that's just gorgeous. And, and that opportunity to create that pretty much fell into my lap. And I jumped on it. I thought, oh, my gosh, this would be perfect where someone could come to heal from whatever their struggle is with eating or their body. And so I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate that I get to, to do what I, what I love and um, have a platform to teach that to other people. I, I just can't even think of anything better in life. Yeah, it seems to be perfectly yeah. fitted for you. And um, as I read, it's something or a place for people who really want top-notch professional assistance uh, regarding various disordered eating issues. Do you treat men as well? We don't, simply because we're only eight beds and we're tiny. So we're In all looking... of the different programs? Well, yes, we're just, uh, we have the intensive outpatient in Honolulu. So that's on a different island on, on Oahu. And, and um, yes, for some of the programs, we've treated men. Um, and then we're opening one on the big island of Hawaii. So we start off small, uh, with, as just, with just women, and then we, then we can expand. Mm -hmm. And I have another question. Mm -hmm. Many women 
struggle a lot with their relationship to exercise and may not even be fully aware of this. For me personally, yep. um, it started out pretty harmless when I think about it. Just a mm -hmm. little more exercise here and there when I first started to lose weight over 20 years ago. And it worked perfectly for that matter. But as you might be able to guess, over the years, my relationship to exercise spiraled out, out of control. And I never considered this to be an eating disorder at all, since I never threw up and for the most part wasn't very skinny or not at all. Um, but the idea in my head was that in order to keep my body, as you said before, in a quote unquote acceptable shape and to be able to eat what I wanted, I had to exercise this much. And of course, mm. this turned into a compulsion, a rule, and I couldn't let go. I was so afraid of losing the validation and so-called safety that I got from having a straight-sized body in the end. And now that I'm aware of just how healthy my mental connection between weight and exercise has become over the years, I see it in so many people. Nowadays, yeah. it seems to have become normalized to link exercise to eating. Everybody talks about earning your food and burning off your lunch. And we just never think about the danger of this kind of thinking. So how, how do you approach people who say, or like me, who maybe hide their weight fears behind obsessive exercise habits? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think of it as a polarity. Um, so on one end of the continuum, you've got exercise addiction, which is what you're talking about. The other end is um, exercise resistance. And people move around on the spectrum. And, and they both have the same underpinnings as, you know, as an eating disorder, where it's all connected to weight loss. So with exercise addiction, which is what you described, is this this fear that if you don't do it, you're going to have a body that's that's giant or that it's not going to be accepted in the culture or whatever. And then then there's exercise resistance, which is on the other end, and that's when you feel the urge to move and you sit yourself down. Um, and so the way I approach it is this understanding that all of us, all of us are born with an innate desire to move our bodies for joy. Little kids don't splash in puddles to burn calories. They don't swing on the swing to lose weight. They don't ride their bicycle or play tag thinking like, oh, this will this will take care of my thighs. So you'll, if you look back, you see how this desire to move our body in joy, we're born with it. But then what happens along the line because of the cultural press We are given input that says you need to move your body, even even to say to get fit. You know, that's kind of code for, for lose weight. Mm -hmm. So what I believe is we have uh, e either we get hijacked by the cultural press and we believe all that nonsense. Or there's a part of us, which my friend Francie White, she's a dietitian from California, and she created the concept of exercise resistance. And she says we have this ancient she-wolf who just will rise up and say, you will not usurp my desire to move my body in joy. I'm not doing a damn thing. I'm just going to sit right here. So either you have the inner rebel that rises up and, and, and is so angry that the culture has taken this away, or the one that gets hooked by it, and then we move around on that continuum. So, so the key is to go back to that time, to find a time in your mind's eye when you moved simply for the joy of it, that you rode your bike to feel the wind move through your hair, or, or, or you played tag with your friends just because it was fun, not because you had an extra donut, um, and, and that to go back and remember that. It's a process of remembering, remembering the essence that we were born with, and then start to move your body in joy. And when it stops feeling joyful, you stop. And then you go, then you wait for the urge to move. You see, it's an instinct in us. It's an instinct as, as real as our instinct to eat or sleep or go to the bathroom. We have an instinct that has been usurped by the culture, but it's there inside of you. And it's worth finding so that um, you find what you love uh, and, and then you start to do that and because you love it it's it's in then that's something you'll do more and more but not too much and not too little so we have to tackle the our own weight fears first because there's what the whole thing 
is sort of uh, centering around. Well, I mean, I I find it hard to reduce exercise because then the old weight fear comes up again. So I think so this is the first thing to actually so you, tackle. You do it simultaneously. So you go to do something and you start paying attention to how it feels in your body. And as soon as you have a thought that's connected to weight loss, as soon as you have the thought that says, oh, I got to keep going, this is not enough. And you ask yourself, well, does it feel good? If, if it's like, no, but I have to, because as soon as the should comes in, you stop. And then the fear comes up. And, 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 then you, and then you wait, it will pass. That fear will pass. And then, so each time you start moving, when the fear of the should comes in, you stop. And just do it as an experiment. Say, okay, for one week. What can happen in one week? For one week, I'm going to move my body when it feels good. See what happens. Because by nature, we humans are, are built to do what feels good. And so let's say you have pain and you just keep pushing past the pain. Let your, let your dog talk to you. <laughs> your dog says, okay, enough for now. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean, you know, you have to stop forever, but... Let's try something else if, and, and see if we can tweak this so, so that it, it, it feels better. And, and you know, so it, it really requires the experimenting, sometimes putting on music and moving your body to the music and until, it, it, until you start thinking, oh, if I keep going, I'm going to lose weight, then stop. Mm -hmm. But it's a matter of reclaiming our birthright. Our birthright is to move our body in joy. Can you um, give hope to people who are now still thinking that they will not survive if they gain more weight or yeah. that they will not be accepted and that it's actually possible to reach a stage where, we'll, where we are able to say, look, this is my body, it's okay the way it is and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean that I'm less worthy or less desirable and if anyone thinks so, that's on them, not on me. I think you can get there for the most part. However, I'm fully cognizant of what it's like to be a woman in this culture. But, so, but I think if you become aware, then you might have a couple minutes of angst. And then you go, oh, wait, no, I remember now. I remember who I am. And this is nonsense. This is the nonsense of the culture, you know, landing in my mind, and I don't have to follow that. So I, I think it is an ongoing process. I, I remember I do these um, retreats in Hawaii uh, with Carolyn Costin and Francie White, where for a week we spend, uh, uh, we have about 30 professionals who work in the field of body image and, and come from all over the world. And there was this one woman, and about 50% of them have had their own recovery uh, process. And this one woman said, you know, I worked forever to clear my eating disorder. And I finally did. And then I started working on my negative body image. But now there's aging. <laughs> That's right, folks. It never ends, really. But if you have a skill set, if you have a toolkit, it will pop up because you go, oh, my God, where does this wrinkle come from? Because our cult the culture is, is always reminding you of that. But it, it doesn't have to last for for hours and days and weeks and months and forever it, they're just moments and that's all they are and then they pass and then you're comfortable in your own skin again that's why it's so important to have community and a yeah. sisterhood of women to remind us that we're not actually just, okay the way we are and the rest is nonsense <laughs> and there's a lot of nonsense out there yeah yeah i'll take that as a last word <laughs> um where can people find you if they want to work with you um, I have a website, dranitajohnston.com, or uh, through uh, lightofthemooncafe.com, or iponomaui.com. I will put all three in the show notes of this episode, of course. And before I can let you go, I want to ask you my final question, which is, what would you like to be remembered for? I think compassionate curiosity. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Thank you so much for your time. And um, thank you for your enlightening insights on this, <laughs> on this topic. Well, I want to thank you. I have been following your work. I love what you're doing. You're giving voice 
and voices. You're creating a chorus of voices that can be heard all over the world. And I so appreciate that. Yeah, I, I made my own family, you know, <laughs> I created my own family and my own community. And it's good. I profit from it just as much as others do. So my thanks go right back to you. <laughs> I wish you a very nice day and thank you for your time. Thank you, Merit. This was today's dose of badassery from Life Unrestricted. Find the show notes with links to everything we mentioned in this episode over at lifeunrestricted.org. And if this show is making you feel good, awesome, make sure to subscribe and please let others feel good too. By leaving a five-star review on iTunes, you'll help make this show more visible and therefore more accessible for others. You're the best. Thanks. Thanks.